Today is our final day of Chakra 3.0, our Chakra 3.0 series. So we're looking at the seventh chakra. And for anybody who's um, new or joining us, if you hear puppy sounds in the background, I am integrating a puppy into my life, so there may be puppy sounds <laughs> in the background. It's sort of a funny analogy of the seventh chakra, you know, that we have this idea that the seventh chakra is this um, awareness beyond the third dimension, you know, it's this divine, you know, it actually, sahasraha, the, the meaning of the seventh chakra, it means thousand-petaled lotus, right? But so often we've disconnected from that in a way that says, oh, well, this awareness, it means I'm no longer really part of the world, like I'm beyond it, I've transcended it, I've, um, the tiny little things of the little people do not bother me. <laughs> like it's sort of that funny, um, aloof arrogance that can happen in the spiritual world. And, and I think that part of this problem comes from in the physical world that we separated um, from spirituality. You know, years ago in India, we once had, and I'm talking about India only because, uh, first of all, it's one in an ancient culture, but it's also where these ideas of the chakras come from, right? Well, what's interesting is thousands of years ago, there were tribes all over India. And a lot of them were uh, these indigenous tribes. Some followed the goddess, some followed uh, various versions of spirituality. But one thing that they had in common was that spirituality was part of life. We didn't separate the seventh chakra or the sixth chakra from the first chakra or the second chakra. It was all just one. It was, well, of course, spirituality is part of my life. Of course, spirituality is part of my relationships. Of course, spirituality is part of my mission here. Like it was a, of course. And then four or five thousand years ago people came out of the north of the Himalayas and they were called the Aryans like the Aryan race and they came in and they established themselves in India and created the caste system and they called themselves the Brahmins and the Brahmins you know considered themselves close to God and they then installed the caste system so that they no longer worked, right? They were um, the spiritual ones. They were the ones closest to God and everyone else was just really here to serve them and to work. And so beneath them, they installed the government and the militia. And beneath that, they, did, they installed the, um, the merchants, the teachers, the doctors, you know, what, what we would in the white, the West called the white collar workers. Then there were the blue collar workers, all the, the manual laborers. And then what they called the untouchables were basically people of no value to them, right? Maybe they didn't work. Maybe they were sick. Maybe they were addicted, whatever. But, and you can see this caste system throughout the whole world. It isn't just in India. This, this organization of humans is everywhere. And this is one of, and this organization is one of the things that connect, disconnects us from the seventh chakra. Because there's many reasons. One of them is that the seventh chakra isn't for the common person. It's only for the priests. It's only for the gurus. It's only for the Brahmins. It's only for the enlightened ones. The rest of us, are nothing but lowly servants 
sinful by birth. You know, we are just nothing, right? We are only human. And this kind of mentality, this kind of paradigm that we live within seriously disconnects us from the potential of our own seventh chakra. <laughs> Storm agrees. And so this is really, really important to understand because this, this series is all about understanding our chakras in the light. And our seventh chakra in the light. So forget about the fact that we've been disconnected from it. Forget about the fact that we've been given limited belief systems to kind of put us in our place or for whatever reason. And we will talk about those limited belief systems for sure because they're important for our healing. But if we really imagine the seventh chakra in the light, we have to really understand what is this? This is us connected to the infinite world. This is us connected to the galaxies. This is us connected to God, how you understand God to mean, and not the limited version that we've been taught that sort of scares us and keeps us small, but whatever the expansive definition of God is for you. And to understand that this is part of us, this seventh chakra is part of us. It's not out there in a temple. It's not out there in the Himalayas. It's not out there in the minds of the guru. And we are just the lowly students. Every one of us has a seventh chakra. And what that tells us is that that seventh chakra is meant to be integrated into our whole being. It's meant to be part of our definition of self. It's meant to be part of our definition of life. It's not meant to be something that someone else explains to us, or else we wouldn't be given a seventh chakra. If we, were, if we didn't have this as part of our energy being, we would all have to go to Delphi in Greece, or we would have to go to some place to access our seventh chakra. And isn't it interesting how in so many cultures we believe that? I need to go to a sacred place to access the divine. I need to do this, this pilgrimage to access my seventh chakra because we've been deeply taught that it is separate from us. It isn't for us. It's only for the enlightened ones. Well, who decided they were the enlightened ones? Right? It's, it's a very dangerous thing. And, and again, th even that idea can permeate down into the spiritual communities where suddenly even us on our journey, we can become very arrogant. It's almost like in the same way in a commercial world where we define everything by money, we believe that success is anything that is... is um, creating a life where we make a lot of money. And now we get to be top dog because we have lots of money and we have a successful job. So now I get to be the top rung, right? It's the same thing in the spiritual community. If we're super attached to being these aloof, enlightened beings, you know, we're in big trouble. You know, because this seventh chakra is meant to be part of every chakra. And this is really, really important to help us access it, to help every one of us access our own divinity and to really experience it in the light. The one thing I want to talk about for a moment is to imagine this idea of infinity because first of all it's an idea that is not actually comprehensible the brain we were given is actually meant to be used in this 
three-dimensional physical world. It's meant to interpret our five senses or the inputs that we get through the world through our five senses. As soon as we start conceptualizing things in the seventh chakra, or even the sixth chakra, we get into trouble. And the idea of infinity is one of those really challenging concepts to try to get into our brains. And the, the problem with it is, is we think of infinity as this infinitely large thing, right? We learn this in school. We'll say, well, can you count to a million? Can you count to a billion? Can you count to a trillion? What can you count to? And then we go dot, 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 infinity. Like it's this infinitely large number, which is partially true, but it makes it extremely hard to fathom. Instead, just for the sake of our conversation today, or maybe beyond, imagine instead infinity is oneness. So even mathematically, if what's interesting about this is if you take, because I, I am a mathematician at my core, <laughs> if you take one, so one means all. So if you imagine I am one person. Well, this is a completeness. It's not just the number one, and then you have two and three and four. Two is just two ones. Three is just three ones. If there's three people in the room. There are three individuals in the room. So now let's go into my oneness. Here is my oneness. You can take half of me, and now you have one over two. I've split in two, right? You can split into four. You can split into eight. You can split into 16. You could split into 100 pieces. Like let's say you have a pie and you have a whole pie. You could split it in half. You can split it in quarters. You can split it in tenths. You can split it in hundredths. You can split it in a thousand. You can split it into infinite number of pieces. So sometimes it's easier to imagine infinity as infinite divisions of oneness because it's easier to imagine oneness so now you imagine this within yourself you are a oneness i used to love that david bohm used to say that we are individual and what he meant was undivided individual and that when we treat ourselves as an individual, as an undivided being, we will find happiness. We will be in full connection with our consciousness. So now, to imagine that this is the goal of our talk today, is to really become undivided. And that means that our seventh chakra, as much as we may be looking at it separately from the other chakras, it is part of the whole. It must be part of the whole for us to be an individual. We don't want to be a part being. We don't want to just be physical without the divine. And we don't want to be divine without the physical. You know, there's no point of having lofty philosophical thoughts if we aren't helping the world if we aren't experiencing joy, if we aren't bringing it back to the village, right? What's the point of being philosophical if they're literally of no earthly good? So if you imagine, we do each have this perfect seventh chakra within us. But we have a world that teaches us that it's not part of us, that we're limited. And so then we have an interface that is set up in between this divinity and the world. And so this talk is all about how we heal that. So one of the first things we do want to look at is the home we were raised in. Because for all intents and purposes, our parents or whoever raised us were our first experience of God. They were our first experience of this seventh chakra awareness. 
How they define the world is how we define the world. Because they were everything. They literally physically brought us into the world. Or maybe you were raised by adoptive parents. Regardless of who actually brought you in, these people who raised you, you know, and they could be a grandparent or an aunt and uncle or, or adoptive parents, but regardless, they define the world that we live in. And this is our seventh chakra. So on some level, we imagine, well, obviously, that affects our first chakra, right? Our sense of safety, security, abundance. Do we live in a world of scarcity? All that kind of thing. But again, the, all of the chakras are connected. And if you imagine the first chakra and the seventh chakra are both source energy. So the first chakra is sort of how we connect in with the world. And the seventh chakra is how we understand the world. What's the big picture to the little details of life? So it's very important to look at this and not because it, it has to be limiting and not because we want to demonize our parents or we don't want to look at it negatively, but to simply just look at that and say, interesting, my parents believed that people were inherently scary and you had to really protect yourself. My parents believed that money defines success and worthiness in the world. My parents believed that God was out there or God was in church on Sunday and you had to be selfless in order to connect with God. This is really important to look at these foundational beliefs because these define what we believe God to be. Maybe our parents believe that there was no God, that we were simply just worm food and nothing more than bumbling neurons. And again, it's just important to look at it and say, that was my first experience. And maybe I rejected it as a child or maybe I rejected it as a teenager or a young adult. And I developed my own understanding of things. You know, that's possible. But it's really important to look at it because if we believe that I am nothing but a lowly human, that I am limited, that I'm a loser, or that I must achieve financial success in the world to be successful, this is important to note because a lot of these things will limit our connection to our infinite self because we're so incredibly focused in the physical world. And all that being said, that where it's not that financial success is bad, but sometimes we actually equate our worthiness as a human based on our career, our financial success, whether we're married, whether we had children, whether we fit in. Well, none of this has to do with our seventh chakra awareness. None of this has to do with our infinite self. Right? And again, it's not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's integrating the infinite self into the whole. And if we have these beliefs, these are limiting beliefs that don't help us really connect with the infinite aspect of ourselves. You know? Imagine, I remember uh, reading that Einstein once said that the sign of true genius is to be able to hold two opposing views in your mind at the same time without going crazy. Well, I actually, I'm really intrigued with the concept of genius. And I actually believe that the difference between someone who's just smart and a genius is that the genius accesses their divine self. And I think one of the reasons that this concept of genius is so interesting is that every one of us is capable of this genius. Again, it's not just for the aloof. It's not just for the people who did well in school. I think genius is accessible to everyone. The key is to access our seventh chakra, our sixth chakra, these higher centers that have been poo-pooed by, you know, whatever, the, or the organization, society, whatever. But as soon as we start to access our own personal insight and we start to realize that we really are infinite beings and we're just living out this very interesting incarnation 
and we stop fighting who we are. We stop fighting and hoping, oh, I wish I was different. I wish I was taller, shorter, smarter, fatter, thinner, more wealthy, born to a different caste, whatever. I wish my life was different. As soon as we stop wishing we were different, we start to embrace. It's almost like all of our chakras light up and the interface disappears and we start to be alive. And then we start to really access our highest selves. So then all of a sudden, every single one of us simply manifests the inspiration that's within us. And we all become genius. But the number one way to do that is to be able to hold these two different aspects of ourselves in harmony within us. And those two aspects are this divine, infinite self and this very limited incarnation, right? It is true. If you were born a particular gender in a particular society, that it may be a limiting factor. If you were born into a certain level of society, whether we believe in it or not, this can be a limiting factor in terms of financial success or how we're viewed in the world and all this nonsense, right? It's a reality. And so it's a very interesting thing to kind of hold that reality and our infinite selves within us at the same time, right? Like that, that's a real, that's a real accomplishment to be able to hold these two things. But it's all part of us. So I believe that it's by design that we're really meant to do that. Oh, the other, the other thing that I want to mention in terms of the, the difficult things are even these ideas of God. That in our world, the definitions of God are often what also disconnect us from the seventh chakra. Because we have organized religion which creates a story of what God is and what God isn't and your interaction with God and and there's a few problems with it one of them is that we define it at all that hey is that we define it at all because we're not meant to define it the very concept is ineffable indescribable it's, it's beyond the, the, the physical world, words of the human. And as soon as we do describe it, we're wrong. You know, this is why in every religion, do not define me. Do not put words to me. Do not build idols in my name. You know, if you see the Buddha on the path, kill him. The Tao that can be named is not the Tao. This is all very important because these are the things that get us in trouble. And so the very fact that we may have a definition of God in our mind is a problem because that's a limiting. It's almost like we have this infinite space and we've created this limited little thing that we now are going to try to fit our infinite self into or we just fight against it. You know, I know a lot of people who have been raised in, in strict religion uh, religious high families they, they you know they've said to me just recently someone said to me well I don't believe in God because I don't believe you know look what the Christians did and look what the Christians did and it's like yeah but the Christians don't define God they do within their world but they don't own infinite consciousness and so if we reject the religion of our childhood we sometimes throw the baby out with the bathwater and we throw out our own seventh chakra. So it's very interesting to look at our own definitions of divinity that we may have internalized over, over our lifetime. And how can we access this in an infinite way instead? And very often it's through experience. It's through these moments of life where there is no time and space. You know, we've talked in previous talks about reference points. And my teacher, Jim, my first spiritual teacher, 
he used to say that, he'd say, you have to develop different reference points for living. Because if we define ourselves based on, well, I am a woman, I am an author, I am a mother, I make X amount of dollars per year, I live in Canada, I whatever, all these things that I may define myself based on, it's almost like these are the, the ropes that hold me still and safe in the world. And then I live in infinite fear because what if one of those things change? What if I lose one of those things, right? And he used to say, these are all transient definitions of self. They're not you. They're not seventh chakra. They don't consider the seventh chakra. These might be part of my current reality in my lower reality, right? In my physical reality, but they're just temporary. And they're even temporary to this lifetime, however we understand that. So how could we have a reference point that actually integrates all the chakras, not just my first chakra, not just my second chakra, not just my third chakra. What is a reference point that I can hold on to, that I can depend on, that is also timeless? And so these are these moments in life that time disappears for us. Our definition of self disappears. You know, they're the moments where, you know, and it could be something as simple as stargazing. You know, those moments when you're lying under the stars and it's overwhelming to imagine that we're part of this galaxy. But instead of letting our brain separate ourselves from this great galaxy, we release the wall and we just let ourselves bathe in that infinity. Or maybe you have moments where you really feel emerging with another person. Maybe it's in sexual intimacy. Maybe it's this feeling of holding a grandchild. Maybe it's a moment of playing with a puppy and feeling complete bliss in the world. These are the moments when we will have experiences of the seventh chakra. You can't define it, but you can experience it if we allow ourselves to feel joy, if we allow ourselves to feel peace. If you imagine what are the, what are the aspects of the seventh chakra in the light? Peace, timelessness, joy, wonder, divine wisdom, mystery, what if we simply set ourselves up to be able to experience these things? And then it doesn't have to have words. We don't have to define it because we know it, right? We know it in our soul. We feel it. We've experienced it. We have visceral knowledge. Every one of us here can probably close your eyes and have a moment where you remember the first time you ever saw a mountain and you just thought, whoa. Or you looked up at the stars or you sat by an ocean and words sort of disappeared, right? That's a visceral memory. We can literally just time travel back to that moment instantly and remember that feeling of timelessness. So, this is how we heal the seventh chakra. First, we can look at our limiting beliefs that we might have adopted from our parents or the church or the society we were raised in. If we look at, oh, if I was born to these people, then I, I can only ever be this kind of success or something in the world. But then we have to release the limiting beliefs and experience these other things. So then we can look at that. We can say, what if I want to experience joy? Can I experience pure joy in life? So then the question is, what's the, what, are the, what are the programs that rise in your head that say, well, I mean, you can't have joy all the time, right? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, look at the world we live in. I mean, you can't just have joy. 
And that's, these are very interesting things to come up. This is very interesting journaling exercise, right? To sit or even have a discussion with people if you don't like to journal. To say, what limits my joy? Sometimes what limits our joy or living in a state of joy is our belief about responsibility. Well, I can't be joyful when there's other people suffering. Why? Why is that suddenly irresponsible? Why does that suddenly mean you don't care? How does your joy hurt someone else who's hurting? And I don't mean, you know, being insensitive if someone's hurting and walking in full of rose-colored glasses and stuff like that. That's, that's not it. We're still connected to people. We still care, right? But within our own lives, what if we walked around experiencing joy all the time? You know, this is back to our friend Viktor Frankl, who said that the meaning of life is determined by our choice, how we respond in every moment, regardless of our circumstances. And this is a man who developed this idea living in the concentration camps in the Second World War. Like in the land of a lack of joy in the world, this is what he realized is what really defines us as humans are the choices we make in every moment, regardless of circumstances. So today, we might walk through our life and there might be difficult things, there might be things that don't work out, but it doesn't mean we have to suffer. We could look at it and say, oh my gosh, this totally sucks. Can you believe it? And get really angry about it and tell your friends and write angry things about it or whatever. Or we can just simply see it as it is and choose joy anyway. And this is another big program that we have to look at is this idea of judgment. Is judgment real? Is this a function of our whole being? Does judgment exist in our seventh chakra awareness? And I mean the seventh chakra within every one of us, our connection to the whole, our connection to the divine. Is judgment even real? Or is it just a created idea in society? I don't even mean in the third chakra because or the third chakra. I don't even mean in the third dimension or something like that. I mean, is it real at all? Or is it just an idea that we're all playing in? Is it just an idea, brainwashing, an idea that we've all succumbed to? Because if you imagine the world before our air quote civilization, our civilized minds, does nature have judgment? Do the animals in the sea have judgment? Is there judgment in the forest? The, no one judges the shark for eating other fish. No one judges a whale for eating you know, a billion pounds of krill a day. No one judges a thunderstorm and when lightning breaks a tree. That's not bad. It's not wrong. There's no righteous animals in the kingdom. There's just animals. And even the idea of, you know, we as humans have created this, um, oh, that this animal is king of the jungle. But we've only done this based on like a food chain that we observe because we don't understand the cycle of life and the ecosystem and the symbiosis in nature, right? That's just the limit, of our, the limit of our own brain, right? So if you imagine this idea of judgment isn't actually real at all. Not in the first chakra, not in the seventh chakra, not in any chakras. So now imagine releasing all judgment. And, and get, understand, I'm not releasing discernment. In nature, single-celled amoebas move towards that which is nourishing and it runs away from that which is damaging. Animals do have instinct that they come and go 
And if they sense a lion in the area, they hide, right? This isn't just some free for all, whatever happens. We still do have first chakra instincts, but there's no judgment. It just means, oh, danger's around, gotta run. It's one of the great challenges that we actually developed judgment in the world because we use judgment instead of our instincts. That we are taught a program that says it's righteous to stay in a relationship for your whole life instead of listening to our instincts that might have said, it's time to leave now. Nature has no such judgments. Nature has no such programs that say we should do something when everything within us is saying not to. So now imagine a world where we have no judgment. Imagine we've completely released this man-made concept of judgment. There's no right or wrong. There might be things I want to do today, things I feel called to do, things I don't feel called to do, but they're not right or wrong. There might be people I really enjoy their company, and there's maybe people I don't enjoy their company. But the people I do enjoy aren't right and interesting and perfect, and the people I don't enjoy are wrong or anything negative. We're just not on each other's paths. And that's it. There's no judgment required. You know, this is all created. It's not real. So now you imagine experiencing joy in the world because there's no judgment, right? If we're going to heal the interface of our seventh chakra, we have to get rid of the programs that don't apply to real life, right? Especially to an infinite life. Imagine exploring and experiencing wonder. Integrating wonder into our lives, to me, is one of the most powerful ways to integrate the seventh chakra into our world. It's the foundation of becoming tantric in the world, of integrating the divine into our life. Well, what are the things in the interface that interrupt our experience of wonder? It's the belief that we can be educated that we can know things, that we can know everything, that we can understand the world around us. And it's true. If you want to learn a man-made system like accounting or medicine or how to build a car or how to build a bridge, you can teach, you can be taught, you can learn about that, and we can maybe achieve great successes there. But these are just man-made ideas. Right? These are just man-made things that we can excel at. Very, very small aspect of the whole and even of the oneness. You know, what medicine can do for me as an infinite being. It's something. You know, if I'm in a car accident, I certainly want a doctor to help me put my leg on back on. But can medicine access my happiness? Can it affect my view of the reality? Can it affect every part of me? No, it's a limited human creation to try to help people. But it's very limited. And so even what we can learn in school, what's fascinating is very often what we learn in school is very limited. You know, let's say we learn the name of an insect. And now we think that we know the name of this insect, so now we know this insect. Well, the cool thing is if you imagine this infinity, infinity within the oneness, if you took a single insect, let's take a, a praying mantis, and you went down the praying mantis rabbit hole, and you started learning about all the intricacy of a, intricacies of a praying mantis's life, and you looked at how they were made, and how their inner workings were. And then you looked at how they, how they interacted in the ecosystem. And you look at their evolution over time. And you keep, and then you maybe look into native belief systems, beliefs about um, praying mantises. And you keep going and you keep going. There is an infinite world that you can dive into. And all you did was look at a praying mantis. And then what if you look at something like even sunshine? 
and you start really understanding the inner workings of the sun and you start understanding how solar flares affect the earth and you start to understand how we interact with the sun. An infinite study can happen simply looking at this one thing called the sun. Well, now all of a sudden, when we really understand this infinite aspect of every singular thing that we look at, how can we not look at the world in wonder? How can we not walk down the street and realize every single thing I see is a universe unto itself? And all of these individual universes are living in symbiosis with every other little universe. How could I possibly conceptualize this? How could I possibly imagine that I understand this? But because we have a belief system that says you're supposed to understand this, this makes you smart, this makes you intelligent. This is a very limiting belief system. But what if we embrace the seventh chakra aspect of who we are and we look through the world, like through the eyes of God, through the eyes of the infinite, and we see the infinity that surrounds us? And I'm not even talking about the humans in our life who are each infinite universes unto themselves. You know, in one of my classes yesterday, Someone talked about one of the overwhelming things about the tantric journey is really realizing that there is a kingdom within each of us. That if we simply went within and dove deep into our own experience of life, that there is a kingdom to be explored there. This is what brings wonder into our life. This is what brings wonder into our experience. Imagine if all we did was walk through our day today, realizing that we have no idea of this world around us and that that's a blissful idea. It's not overwhelming. It doesn't mean we're ignorant. We were born into an infinite world of abundance. And when we can kind of release these structures, that thousand-petaled lotus of our seventh chakra just opens to the sun. And we receive this infinity from every single thing around us. This is not something we can conceptualize with our mind. We have to just open ourselves to the possibility and experience it. And you can feel like your whole top of your head just relax and open, you know? And then maybe we imagine something like timelessness. You know, there's a lot of limiting ideas out there that we only have so much time. Time is limited. I don't have enough time to get the things done I want in the day. What if you have all the time in the world? You know, this again, this idea of time is a man-made construct. Yes, we can observe that the Earth, you know, orbits the sun and the sun orbits the galactic center and the Earth turns and we have day and night and moons every 28 days and we can observe all those things. And those things, I believe, actually connect us to a much greater galactic consciousness. But this idea of cutting our day into chunks of time is very strange, right? It's a very strange idea that also gets into our brain that makes us say, but I only have so many minutes in the day to accomplish these things that I must accomplish, right? I only have this much time and it's very important that I accomplish these things in this day. What if this concept of time also isn't actually real? And I'm only talking about this in the land of embracing the seventh chakra. If we're living in a world that is bound by time and appointments, then it's important to be here on time. 
it's important for us to come to this class on time or we don't get to have this experience. So again, this is the ability to embrace both sides, to embrace the world that we do live in a time-space continuum. We do live in a way that we want to interact with each other at certain times. And we are infinite. And that perhaps time will bend to our consciousness. And that as we experience different things and as we want and as our intention says, I want to still have all the time in the world to do everything I want to do. What if reality bends to that and allows that to happen? You know, this is, you know, even our integration of our puppy friend into our world, right? It's really easy to get caught in the world that says, I'm not getting done what I normally get done. And so part of my meditation in the last few days has been, I have all the time in the world to accomplish everything I want to accomplish. That the addition of this puppy into my life is an addition. It adds to my world. It, it creates new facets of experience that will nourish all of me. So you imagine we look into our lives and we look at the curious situations we find ourselves in. And what if these circumstances somehow expand us? If we relax the beliefs that say, oh, now I don't have time. Oh, now I can't do that. What if we just turn it around and say, well, this is an interesting expansion, <laughs> right? What if we change the mantras of our life? And this brings us into another aspect of this, is this aspect of mystery. That what if the world is filled with mystery? Because we've lived in, in a, a world, I mean, whether we it's the Piscean Age, whatever, the Kali Yuga, however we understand the world we've come out of, but we only value the things we know, the masculine as opposed to the feminine unknown, the feminine mystery in all beings. This has nothing to do with gender. Well, what if we realize when we really integrate the seventh chakra that there is more out in the world than we could ever understand? And what if we love it? What if we love this mysterious place we get to explore? What if that's part of our never-ending, infinite world? Right? And the other beautiful thing that I want to just finish off on before we go to questions is the other aspect of this seventh chakra integration and the sixth and the fifth for sure. But the seventh is that we really do have access to that infinite knowledge base. There are so many psychics, you know, sort of, you know, the first I ever read of was Edgar Cayce, that when you know, whether it was under hypnosis or whether in a fever, he could actually access information that he couldn't in his waking moments, in his waking consciousness. But what if all of us can do that? Then we don't need to be hypnotized. You know, the only, a lot of hypnotists say that they don't actually hypnotize people, they unhypnotize people. They actually unhypnotize people from what the limiting beliefs we've been taught. So what if we allow ourselves to be unhypnotized and we actually are, we know that we actually can access great wisdom all the time, right? It's funny, like one of my favorite movies is The Matrix. And of course, this is a huge concept that they integrate there, that all you have to do, I mean, they do it in physical form, that they just have to radio up to Tank, right, the guy, and say, I need to be able to fly this helicopter. And they download the program, and now I can fly the helicopter. What if it's that simple? What if I'm integrating this puppy into my life, and I need some wisdom to be able to have the 
skills to raise a puppy in a healthy way? And what if that an idea comes into my mind or a, a piece of wisdom pops in or maybe even an idea to just go and look up this website? That it's all at our fingertips right now. And if it doesn't come to us here, it'll come to us through other people. Right? Either in person or on the internet or through a book or something. So it's a very interesting thing to simply allow the seventh chakra. Like it's not something we can touch. We just simply allow it by releasing all the limited, limiting ideas that we're not infinite and divine and that the world isn't full of wonder and that peace is possible. We can have peace within. No matter what's going on out there, we can choose our reality if we can release the judgment and we can release the idea that we have to know and understand everything. All we need to know is enough to follow our own path and discern where we're supposed to be and where we're not supposed to be and discern where we want to place our attention and where we don't. We don't need judgment for any of that. And then we just allow the inspiration to flow through us and just trust that you know we have all the time in the world and the resources to do whatever we want to do. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. And I hope you have a wonderful day.